Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to our PAX Online talk, The Narrative Design of Midsommar, What Horror Games Can Learn. My name is Anna Webster. I'm a junior narrative designer at Heartsuit Labs. I specialize in horror and RPGs. And I am joined here by my fabulous co-panelists and co-cultists. Um, everyone, introduce yourself. Say hello. Hi, I'm GC Bacaris, a.k.a. Grimm, and I'm a freelance game writer and developer. I, too, have a profound interest in horror, and I've been known to jump at any opportunity to discuss the weird and unsettling. Hi, my name is Zaire, and I'm a narrative designer at Unknown Worlds on Subnautica Below Zero. I, too, have an interest in horror and spooky stuff, uh, most notably my Kickstarter uh, for the comic The Bone Herder. Hi, I'm Nessa Cannon. I'm an indie game developer who also specializes in horror and wholesome games, and I made my own flower crown. Very proud of you. <laughs> we are going to kick things off today with a quick PSA from everyone's favorite plague doctor, Grimm. Hi, again. So, since we're going to be discussing a movie in conjunction with game development, we just wanted to note that in asserting that games have something to take away from this film, we aren't suggesting that games need to be more cinematic, need to be more like movies, or similar arguments. We did find certain aspects of this film to be relevant to the horror genre as a whole, and to have multidisciplinary multimedia applications which are also relevant to the field of game development. And there you have it, folks. Um, going to be turning things over to our first panelist now, which I believe is Ms. Nessa Cannon. Hi, everybody. Um, before I start the presentation, I wanted to throw in a really quick trigger warning. Um, we'll be discussing plot elements of the film throughout this talk, so if you would like to remain unspoiled, please come back after you've watched the film. Um, we'd also like to note that there are a variety of subjects in the movie that might be triggering or upsetting to some viewers, such as the ones listed here, and we will be discussing some of these subjects in our presentation, so please proceed with caution. My section of our presentation is called Put Him in the Bear, and it's about Danny's agency in Midsommar, how that conflicts with what we know about agency in horror, and what we can learn from it. Before we narrowed the subject of our talk down to narrative design, I was going to rant for 10 minutes about writing more non-cisgender, non-heterosexual, non-white, non-men into horror games. Um, now that I've changed my topic, I can only rant for 30 seconds about that. So. Um, please write more non-cisgender, non-heterosexual, non-white, non-men into your horror games. Um, please hire the people who can write these diverse backgrounds. Um, give these characters quality arcs and backgrounds and characterization. Hire sensitivity readers. Um, take what's been poorly done in the horror genre and flip it on, flip it on its head. Um, statistics show us that women consume more horror content than men do. Uh, and there's no doubt in my mind that an inclusive study with gender non-conforming non folks would show us the same result. So um, please make an effort to be more inclusive. What I'm actually here to talk about today is um, the amount of agency that Danny has in Midsommar and how that can translate to horror games even if the narrative is linear. First, I'd like to define agency. Agency is the sense that our actions or a character's actions have meaning and a direct impact on where the story is leading us. These actions can be as simple as surviving a particular situation or saying yes or no to a question or as complex as performing the right sequence of actions to prevent the universe from spontaneously imploding. Um, I found this quote from Janet Murray that really stuck with me while I was researching agency. When the things we do bring tangible results, we experience the second characteristic delight of electronic environments, the sense of agency. Agency is the satisfying power to take meaningful action and see the results of our decisions and choices. The horror genre as a whole has a really complicated relationship with agency. Um, creating something unsettling or horrifying often entails removing control from the situation from our characters because there's very little humans hate more than feeling out of control, you know, speaking from a psychological 
point of view. Um, a lot of horror movies are explicitly built on the premise of things happening to characters as opposed to happening because a character made a decision. Um, this is why franchises like Scream and Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th can go on forever on a very simple premise, like teens being terrorized by serial killers in various settings. Um, in terms of Midsommar, I'd like to analyze both Danny and Christian's agency. When we start our journey with Danny, we know that she's traumatized and in a relationship where the other person has one foot in the door and one foot out. And that's the nice way of putting it. Um, Ari Aster includes a lot of visual cues that Danny's primary motivation is literally just keeping it together at the beginning of the movie, um, including her body language when she's around Christian and his friends. And um, we could, uh, you know, go into her costume choices and everything. But even with those, we never get the feeling that Danny is completely out of control. She is uh, definitely the driving force of this story. We progress because of her smaller actions, like calling Christian out for lying to her, deciding to go with the boys on their trip, telling Christian that deserting her sounds like something he would do, and um, because of her larger actions, like, you know, the bear, and um, reacting to cheating on her. Uh, almost every story beat is Danny's action or reaction to a situation. Uh, she's in an unfamiliar place and for a lot of characters that would remove her agency or her confidence in her decisions. But as Zaire mentions later, by the end of the film, she has made the conscious decision to adapt and survive and thrive um, in this new and strange place. Danny bends the reality of the Harga around her to survive, and whether what she does is morally correct or not remains to be seen. But she's alive, and that's more than Christian can say. So let's talk about Christian. Um, since horror is a mainly male-dominated genre, and if women are there, it's more likely than not that they're dead, sexualized, inept, or even worse, um, it's worth exploring what Christian's role in Midsommar is. Christian is so passive that it's infuriating. Um, we get frustrated with him. He can't make decisions for himself. He can't even comfort or communicate any emotions to his longtime girlfriend. Um, he literally steals Mark's thesis idea. Um, and he kind of just says yes when offered to do this terrible, awful thing um, and cheat on Danny. You know, um, it's also worth noting that Christian's demise isn't just due to Danny's revenge, but also because of Maya's scheme, bringing us back to women having more agency in this film than men do. And I could do a whole talk about the damsel of distress trope um, in horror, but you know, that's next year. Uh, this passiveness Christian has throughout the whole film comes to fruition when he spends his last moments literally paralyzed in a bear suit, while Danny is, by more than one definition of the word, blossoming. So how can we tie this back to narrative design in horror games? There are two ways we can apply Midsommar to create um, different and new and interesting spooky scenarios. And one of those is giving control to your characters instead of removing it, as well as talking more about the morality that comes with that control. Um, like I said before, horror is, as a whole, is deeply, <laughs> deeply rooted in our relationship with control. Most movies and games remove the aspect of control from their protagonists, and as a result, they can end up becoming reactionary or sometimes stagnant. Um, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's tried and true for a reason. Um, you know, if it didn't work, horror wouldn't exist. Um, but Midsommar shows us that giving characters clear and direct control over their destiny leads to more interesting conundrums than do they survive this situation or not. Um, we could explore more things like at what cost do they survive and what would happen if they made the decision to embrace this situation. When a main, main character is designed right, their decisions have the potential to be scarier than a monster's or the murderer's or the coldest. Which leads me to my next slide about moral agency. 
the Game Narrative Toolbox has a specific definition for moral agency. Uh, the Game Narr Narrative Toolbox is amazing. Please read it if you haven't. Um, their definition is, whenever a player makes a decision in a game that can be framed as right or wrong, or good or good and evil, this is moral agency. This is a concept all narrative designers and game writers know, whether or not we use this specific term, and can be as simple as say the nice thing, or say the mean thing, um, or it can be kill or spare the murderer. Um, there's a broad spectrum of these moral choices, and Midsommar leans into decisions where the interpretations can vary wildly from person to person. Um, I knew people who were more empathetic towards Christian, saying they didn't really believe he deserved to die, and other people who believed Danny absolutely had a right to do what she did. Um, and I have a hard time thinking of a lot of horror games that are that divisive around one single question. Um, one good one that comes to mind is Bioshock in the conundrum of harvesting the little sisters or not. But um, that brings us to when horror turns away from the question of will this character live and turns deeper into how will they live. There's a myriad of different branches that can come from that. Um, changing from a yes or no question to a how question uh, can make any stereotypical teen scream slasher movie in infinitely more interesting. In conclusion, um, hire and write more than cishet white men. Analyze agency and what it means in your genre. Think about your characters or players' actions just as much as their reactions. Broaden the scope of your morality questions and think more about how questions instead of yes or no questions. Horror isn't just interesting when someone dies. It's more interesting when we know why they did what they did to live. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Anna. Hello, everyone. Uh, once again, I'm Anna Webster. And for those of you who knew me in real life back when that was a thing, or you follow me on Twitter, you may know that back before I got into game design and narrative design, I was a performing arts student. So I want to talk, using my background today, about music and the Tristan chord in Midsommar. Next slide. So the score of Midsommar was composed by British musician Bobby Kerlick, otherwise known as the Haxon Cloak. Um, and Ari Aster actually wrote the screenplay of Midsommar to his album Excavation. And the score is overall supposed to be indicative of Danny's emotions and the journey that she takes both internally and externally with her friends while at the Harga. Slide. So overall, music and horror, Guido Helt in his book, Music and Levels of Narration in Film, describes good horror music as, here on the left, music as a proxy for the intangible, whether that's an emotion or the monster we're supposed to be afraid of or whatever parallels we draw, plus this blurb on the right, which is musical features of the new music toolbox, which is more 20th century music. So that's atonality, dissonance, sensory extremes, noise as music, that sort of thing. Those two things added together create a really good horror score. Next slide. So comparison for the purpose of application. Horror games, and this is generally speaking, are usually more drawing inspiration from thrillers or action films. So it's usually very driving and percussive. It's got a lot of body through a lot of bass and brass and timpani and then lots of strings for emotion. Midsummer has these really sneaky, beautiful soundscapes that you hardly even notice that they're starting. They're so organic. It's often dissonant, but of course, um, not unpleasantly so. Strings are often, there's great irregularity in the bowing, which makes it sound really unpredictable and unstable. And then of course, a mixture of traditional and electronic instruments that creates everything, um, makes everything sound a little bit more surreal because of how effortlessly they blend. Next slide. So a really good way to think about um, the music as enhancing the story is it's beautiful but I'm scared. So this disparity of what you're listening to is beautiful and what you're experiencing is scary creates an unease in the viewer or the listener. This is really well shown in the track Atisepa or the cliff jumping ritual. Um, so let's take a listen and you'll see what I mean. This is from the center of the piece. It starts with these gorgeous pulsating chords. It's a little Brian Eno, a little Boards of Canada. 
very serene. And they grow and they pulse. And it's really beautiful. And this one's got a little bit of base right at the end. And as they're standing and looking up, they're like, wait a minute. This isn't really about to happen, is it? And you get these twinkling strings. I'm really anxious. Danny's like, wait a minute. They're not going to jump. This isn't really happening, right? And then, this is really happening. Oh no. And with that baseline resolution, it's the sinking feeling in your gut and you feel Danny's dread. It's really, really well done. Stop that, head on over to the next slide. So let's talk about a musical concept with a little bit of an unconventional application. The Tristan Chord is the fir named for the um, opera Tristan and Isolde by Richard Wagner. It's the first chord that's played in the very beginning as part of Tristan's leitmotif. And there's nothing like super fantastic about um, its composition. It's just a half diminished seventh. But it's about where it goes, not where it starts. This chord is played at the very beginning of the opera, and it does not resolve until the end of the opera. And it's Wagner. So that could be like hours away. And it just hangs there. And that was really groundbreaking for the time. And it pretty much changed music forever. Um, and it can create an interesting uh, approach to writing horror, as you'll see. Next slide. Let's take a listen to it, and you can see what I mean. From the very start. Here it is. It kind of hangs there. All right. So what happens with the Tristan chord is it creates this cycle. So you've got the initial chord strike and does not resolve, which creates an emotional evocation of anticipation, anxiety, and dread because the ear wants to hear things resolve. Then eventually, after all of that build up, the chord finally resolves and you get the, whew, the exhale of the relief and the satisfaction and the secondary emotional evocation. That is, unless the cycle begins again and you go around again. We'll refer back to this diagram in a minute. Next slide. So the Tristan chord in Midsommar. Um, this can often be found in a lot of pieces of media in a less tangible way, right? It's not necessarily musical. In Midsummer, after the Atisapa, um, Danny has seen adults just die after she lost her own parents at the beginning of the film. She creates this really choked, dramatic inhale and just gives a little bit of a cry that does not match the inhale. Then, of course, um, you've got the resolution much later in the film during the famous crying scene with the first really big scream that she gives with the other women at the Harga. So during that time, you've got the suppression. In Tristan and Isolde, the lack of the chord resolution is their, their longing and their love not realized. But in Midsummer, it's her repression of her grief and her emotion. Next slide. Quiet moments dovetail with this fairly well. A quiet moment, um, I had to define it myself, but you probably know what it is. Um, it's a relaxed, safe location or a scene, usually sandwiched between very exciting or very frightening other parts of the narrative. Next slide. Within the twist and chord cycle, quiet moments go right there at the secondary evocation, usually right before the chord is about to strike again. Slide. So what do quiet moments do for us? They allow for decompression. It gives the player a space to calm down, get their bearings, which also decreases their stimuli and will increase their stamina for moving forward within your game. It allows reflection, such as what just happened, but it's also a really good place to push narrative as the player's trying to identify what's going on around them. So giving them more narrative during this is usually a really effective way of conveying information. Then it allows redirection. The player's like, okay, went through all of that. Where do I go now? And you can begin the cycle again. Next slide. Midsummer uses quiet moments really well. There's two in particular that I love. Um, the blessing, which comes after the really dramatic maypole sequence 
and the kitchen scene, which is very small, after the Atasapa and Simon mysteriously goes missing. And usually they convey the actual themes of the Harga, which is it's collaborative, idyllic, and feminine. And you begin to see Danny enjoying the time that she's spending at the Harga as you really start to see her transformation unfold. Next slide. Video games haven't been too great about using quiet moments, especially horror games um, of, of late. Usually this can kind of be seen as stopping with Resident Evil 4 because of the reliance on quick time events, even during cutscenes, which means that the player does not get any moments to take a breath. Next slide. Some games that have used quiet moments well, and I think we need to continue using them. Amnesia, you've got the back hall right after the dreaded water part. The score from that is incredible. Then you have Card Bridge and Alice Madness Returns, which is right after a really frightening um, sanatorium sequence and right before the end game starts. And a little bit unconventionally, um, the mini games between nights of Five Nights at Freddy's, starting at Five Nights at Freddy's 2, which is where the player begins to push the narrative of the actual pizza chain and William Afton and all of that jazz. Don't get me started on FINAF. Next slide. So how to make the Tristan Chord work for you? And this can be in your department or your discipline or any other. Consider the, um, the juxtaposition of it's beautiful, but I'm scared. That disparity creates unease. See where you can play that up even more. Um, consider the presence. What seeds do you want to plant that um, are the major themes of your work that can be tristined? And that can sometimes take a little bit of finagling. But what can you plant and just let hang there? And then, of course, consider absence. What do you want this absence of a resolution to be? What do you want the absence of a resolution to mean? Just like in Tristan, it's about love. But in Midsommar, it's about repression of your own emotion. Next slide. Then, of course, consider what's loud. What points of your game are the most stressful, the most sustained, um, that, or it could be the entire narrative. Um, any elements that you think are the overall peak of the intensity of your game. And then think of the soft. Where could you strategically place quiet moments in order to push and enhance the narrative as well as create a good sense of pacing and enhance the loud parts so they're even more loud? And then overall, the pacing. Once you've got your loud and your soft, experiment with how quickly you want that cycle to begin again. Even within the same project, if you've got a non-standard meter and maybe it completes really slowly at one point and then really fast, will keep the player on their toes and will create unexpected twists and turns that they'll never quite be ready for, but they always will be a little bit because they've had their quiet moment. Anyhow, thank you so much for listening to my portion of the talk. You're always welcome to chat me up on Twitter should you have any more questions about music, horror games, FINAF, or the Tristan Chord. Hi, my name is Zaire, and I'm going to talk about the Canary in the Coal Mine, and specifically as it relates to Black people and people of color in Midsummer. Next. All right, so what is the Canary in the Coal Mine? The Canary in the Coal Mine is a practice from when coal miners would go underground and they would put a canary in a birdcage and take it with them. Um, canaries are obviously a lot smaller than a miner, so if they hit a pocket of dangerous gas, the canary was an early warning system. The canary would, would die and the miners would say, oh, this is not a, a, a safe situation and they would go back up to the surface um, in order to avoid bodily harm to themselves. And so what we can take from that is uh, the body knows, the mind knows, and if you ignore them, it's at your own risk. And in horror movies, it can be at the risk of your own mortality. Next. Uh, the canary tells you when you don't belong. Um, so it's knowing when you're out of place is often based on experience. Um, this is in real life and also in games. And games operate on a pre-existing schema that you learn. Um, either as you play from either as from prior knowledge or something you learn as you play. So I think the biggest example I can think of is um, red barrels in video games. If you shoot them, they explode, but that's not something that you know right off the top of your head. It's from playing prior games and knowing it. 
So if you give the controller to someone who's not familiar with video games, to them, the red barrel is just a red barrel. It doesn't have any like applied experience to it. Um, and in movies, I in horror movies, the subtle versus obvious indicators of horror um, sometimes remind me of micro versus macro aggressions. Next. Um, and so... For example, if you go with the subtle, um, so the subtle indications of horror would be similar to microaggressions. They're not, you can't easily express what they are. So for me in real life would be if someone touches my hair. Um, for me, that's a microaggression. But for someone else, it's not super obvious. It's like, oh, they just want to touch your hair. It, it, it doesn't necessarily have any obvious malicious intent. Um, and so in the movie, uh, a microaggression I considered to uh, something I consider to be a microaggression is the environment in Midsummer. Um, in one of the scenes, there is a face in the trees. That's Danny's sister that died, um, which is something that happens very quickly. Like you can, I think I watched this movie two or three times before I ever even saw it. Um, so it's something like very quick and very subtle that says, "Hey, this is kind of a weird situation." And then the Hagar themselves, um, in my opinion are an example of a microaggression that's very subtle. They have a, a homogenous society. They're all very blonde, um, very blue-eyed, which in and of itself isn't weird or wrong, but when you combine it with the other microaggressions that happen, such as the pulsing, pulsating flora, um, the never-setting sun, so time isn't easily measured. So the movie takes place, I think the festival is over a course of a few days, but you you never know because you don't have those like daily markers of sunrise, sunset. Um, I, in college, I had a basement room with no windows and I never knew what time of day it was. And I can say it's like super disorienting. And um, I found it very unsettling in the movie as well. Next. Um, so moving on to the obvious, uh, the canary in the coal mine. So these are what I would call macroaggressions. Um, the biggest one that I saw was the constant misinformation that they were being fed. Um, Pele tells Josh and Christian that they can come to his community and because they're anthropologists, they can study his people. But um, when they get there, they're very dismissive. They don't want to easily talk about things. Um, there's constantly uh, kind of this like under thread of secrets being kept from them. And for me as a person of color, uh, there were several times when Josh was giving a look like, hey, this doesn't feel right or something about this is definitely off. Um, one example is when he tries to relate an article of clothing that the, the elders wear to another um, culture that he studied. And they just kind of like give him a look and they say and they like just ignore him and keep going. So he was trying to talk on equal ground. Um, but instead, they were very dismissive. And he said, and I think for him at that moment, that was like, well, that's a little weird. And then um, during one of the ceremonies, as he's trying to figure something out, he pulls out his notebook and it's like, mm, this is not adding up. Like something about this is wrong. And he had his canary in the coal mine moment. But instead of listening to um, his instincts, I felt like he almost wanted to prove himself, which we see in movies a lot. Like, like, why would you go down to that basement? Like, what is there to prove? Like, you have a car with a full tank of gas outside. Go drive it to safety. Um, he tried to stay in an environment that was clearly not safe for him. Next. Um, and then we move to the super obvious, so the macroaggressions. You know, something like if someone was to come to me and say, hey, I heard black people can jump higher because they have an extra muscle in their leg. Like, clearly that's a macroaggression. That's like, anyone seeing that could say, hey, that's kind of racist. And I think the moment for that in Midsummer is the um, elder suicide ceremony. Simon and Connie, the, the people jump off the cliff and they're both like, yo, I'm out. This is weird. This is not a situation I want to be in. Um, they followed their instincts and they died anyway, which um, I think is also a part of horror. Sometimes you just aren't safe. Uh, the power isn't in your hands. You're not going to escape. But they at least listened to their canary in the coal mine and they were like, all right. This is this is not it. This is not why I flew across the ocean to see people jump off of a cliff and kill themselves. Um, so I think in horror, that's uh, like a haunted house. You know, first you have the footsteps in the hallway when no one's there. 
and then you have a chair going across the room and then you have like the face of Satan in the fireplace. Once you see the face of Satan, it's probably time for you to get out. And except for Simon and Connie, everyone else was like, all right, well, we're still going to stay because we're going to, for Josh and Christian, they wanted to study the, the Hagar and for Danny, she was just kind of stuck there with them. Next. Uh, why does Danny live? Um, for her, I I considered this uh, conforming to the bad environment. So if you're in a coal mine, it would be the canary suddenly being able to breathe sulfur. Um, in horror movies, it's when your friend or companion succumbs to evil. So say like the exorcist, um, if the, the, the devil goes into the priest or something like well, that's not quite conforming, but it's it's similar. They they succumb to the evil, they conform to the evil. Danny did it because it seemed like a better alternative than the alienation of being alone. Um, and she found a community that she felt like was uh, supporting her and understood the pain that she was going through. Next. Um, how do these ideas apply to a horror game? Um, I believe that horror is cyclical. It doesn't have to be a constant barrage of jump scares. Um, there's always a, a thread of tension that goes through horror. So it's like the subtle, the slightly more obvious, and then a few big moments that are like, oh, wow, this is, you know, this is horror. This is terrifying. But it's, it's usually, it's, it's always punctuated by small constant atmospheric things that are a multi-sensory experience so it's a combination of sight sound um how your body reacts and how you feel um horror i think is best done when something familiar is undone and twisted so that you can no longer trust it um which i think is like the the never setting sun in midsummer the sunrise sunset is a very familiar environment and um when it doesn't happen in Midsummer, it's it's very strange and it throws throws off your sense of being. Um, and sometimes when you trust your instincts, you're still without power. Uh, just because you listen to your canary doesn't mean that you're automatically safe. Next, um, betrayal is one. So Danny kind of she didn't quite betray her friends, but she subcame succumbs to the environment. Uh, she sees the deaths of her companions and was like, oh well. I'm the May Queen. Um, this is this is kind of like my life now. <laughs> I'm gonna watch my boyfriend burn to death in a bear suit. Um, and I think also that evil can be seductive um, and even idyllic at first. It doesn't always have to be like this nasty, dingy, dirty, haunted house. Sometimes it presents itself as like a beautiful field of grass and people like killing their own animals and living off the land. And to someone that might be very appealing, horror has like a lot of different forms um as christian is saying this truly could have been avoided if they had listened to their canary in the coal mine and they had noticed a lot of the subtle and increasingly more not subtle clues more obvious clues that were popping up um and yeah and he wouldn't have ended up dead in a bear suit and everyone else dying in horrific ways so thank you Hello, once again, I'm GC Bacaris, and I prepared a very relaxing presentation on the uncanny for you. So without further ado, the concept of the uncanny was outlined by Ernst Gentsch in 1906 as something which is strangely familiar or something which identifies eeriness or weirdness in the ordinary. This phenomenon has influenced the studies of Freud, Jacques Lacan, and members of numerous other fields like roboticist Masahiro Mori, whose work we'll be discussing. We see deliberate evocations of the uncanny in Midsummer, including audiovisual effects which tend to prompt the uncanny valley response in the viewer. This concept is not exclusive to cinema, and it can be applied to a wide variety of media in unique ways, including games and interactive narratives. I'd like to briefly clarify that neither the Uncanny nor the Uncanny Valley are new to video games. They've always been present, whether deliberately or not. I do want to take the opportunity to discuss the continued utility and potential of these concepts as they relate to our field. Next. In 1970, robotics professor Masahiro Mori described the concept, which would later be translated as the Uncanny Valley. 
I'll summarize it very simply for our purposes here. According to Mori, human familiarity or comfort with an entity increases as it more strongly resembles a human, up to a certain point at which the subject becomes more strange than familiar. This point is the valley, represented by a sharp dip on a graph at which point the observer's comfort level begins to decline. If something appears very human, but there's also something a little off about its appearance or movement, our affinity will typically start to drop at a dramatic pace. It's sometimes difficult for the observer to identify a specific wrongness in the uncanny subject. They simply find it eerie or anxiety-inducing on an instinctive level. Next. Here is where we really get a visual of this emotional effect. This is figure 3.2 from Maury's article. It demonstrates how, quote, the presence of movement steepens the, the slopes of the uncanny valley. That is to say, if the subject is capable of independent movement like a zombie or a robot positioned lower in the valley, it may provoke a stronger response. The graph also gives us several examples of objects that might evoke the uncanny valley for an observer, identifying certain ghostly theater masks, the sudden death of a healthy person, and human corpses in general as sources of significant discomfort. Next. Mori originally contextualized the uncanny valley within the field of robotics, but we also encounter it often with imprecise waxworks, digital de-aging, very lifelike 3D renderings, motion capture glitches, or the idea as mentioned earlier of ambulating corpses. All creepy. In the case of things like waxworks or the digital representation of a living or dead person, part of the uncanniness can come from a failure to fully replicate an existing likeness. There's also the issue of inappropriate movement speed or synchronization. Faced with 3D rendered characters, observers tend to be unsettled by a lack of sync between voice and lip movement, a lack of impress expre expressiveness rather in the upper face, or an excess of expressiveness in the lower face. Next. An example of CGI-based Uncanny Valley that I found personally unsettling was the 2007 adaptation of Beowulf, seen here on the top right. Other people have listed things like the 2004 adaptation of the Polar Express, shown at the bottom of your screen, and Sophia, the social humanoid robot, top left, as things that have elicited a similar response for them. Next up, I have more examples from Midsummer itself. This scene, a member of the Harga community is wearing the character Mark's disembodied face over his own. You know, as you do. Seeing Mark's lifeless face performing both unnatural motion and unnatural stillness stretched over the contours of another man's skull is effectively unsettling. We don't see Mark's death on screen, but this sudden confirmation that a character we previously saw alive has been stripped of all life, and also of his skin, dips sharply into the uncanny. Next up. In discussing the uncanny effect of death, we can also touch on the effect of seeing someone we recognize as already dead. The appearance of Danny's deceased sister during the May Queen triumphal sequence is subtler than Mark's face used as a mask, but equally if not more unsettling because it's concealed within the scenery, forcing the discerning eye to pick it out and identify it for what it is, as Zayer mentioned earlier. You'll notice it beside the arrow on the slide toward the upper left corner of the screen. Next. The numerous bad trips throughout the film feature distorted human features as well as unnaturally moving foliage and other hallucinations. Some of these are subtler than others. Here we will probably first notice the flowers set in Danny's headdress that appear to breathe. Though the flowers themselves lack any straightforward human likeness, they call to mind the ritualistic sharp gasps we often hear from the Harga throughout the film. Next up, we have a counterpoint from David Hansen of Hansen Robotics, who disputes Maury's hypothesis. Hansen Robotics, I should know, are the creators of Sophia, who we saw earlier in the example slide. Hansen considers the uncanny valley as a, rather, the uncanny valley to be a construct that limits the freedom of artistic exploration and proposes we view Maury's uncanny valley as a path of engagement instead. Of course, in the last few years, we've probably seen a few memes about how much Sophia freaks some people out, but that is still engagement. Observers are still engaging with her on that level. Despite potential feelings of discomfort or revulsion, there are others who are simply fascinated by her. The uncanny doesn't necessarily provoke the same response in all observers. The impression of the uncanny does not always even develop in response to something. Some may find a bad wax likeness viscerally upsetting, while others might find it absurd or funny, and others still may have no opinion at all. The uncanny valley's effect relies to some extent on social constructs that lead to the observer perceiving something as either familiar or abnormal. 
Different societies and individuals from different cultures and time periods may experience disparate effects. Some who are accustomed to a higher degree of realism may find PS1 era graphics more disturbing. Others may find highly realistic motion capture more unsettling instead. Artist and researcher Wade Maranowski agrees with the assessment of the Uncanny Valley as limiting, asserting that it should be utilized instead as an aesthetic framework through which to explore the contemporary artist's experience. An audience's experience, rather. I would posit that Maury's Uncanny Valley and Hansen's proposed path of engagement are each useful concepts which can both coexist. While Maury identifies sources of revulsion and encourages roboticists specifically to ignore this, avoid this, rather, valid enough advice in his field, there's also something to be said for allowing an audience experience to vary, not being restrained by the obligation to avoid freaking people out. For our purposes as game developers and creators of all disciplines, this experience should still be able to include terror. Horror as a genre embraces both of these viewpoints, encouraging the existence of, pursuit of, and varied methods of engagement with the uncanny valley. Next up, we are discussing intentionality. Maury's uncanny valley is characterized by a lack of intent. By creating a human likeness in a robot, it is not the roboticist's intent to provoke revulsion in their creation's observer. This is different in the case of horror media deliberately meant to produce the same response. I would argue that the uncanny valley can still be evoked when a creator, such as a cinematographer, an environment artist, an animator, a writer, or a musician, establishes or adapts to an expectation of normalcy in their work, and then forcibly distorts it. The qualities needed to elicit the uncanny, and which occur in response to the uncanny, are perfectly suited to horror games. It's a salient point, nevertheless, that everything scary is not necessarily uncanny. Many intentionally disturbing concepts don't provoke the same response, either due to a lack of initial familiarity, they're already completely alien with no human likeness, or due to essentially never establishing a comfort level from which to drop because they're immediately revolting. It's almost always, I think, potential for the unintentional uncanny, especially in game development and other technological fields. We should be not only open to that as technology continues to develop, but also willing to lean into it. Next up, we're discussing the potential of the uncanny. I've mentioned that there are a variety of disciplines in which it's possible to evoke the uncanny deliberately. Musician Natasha Deals has described the uncanny as a positive artistic tool which allows a piece of media to effectively create, enhance, and deny the familiar. Deals goes on to situate the uncanny as an endless source of potential and tremendously compelling as a source for manipulation in art. She also asserts that its longevity and evolution as an emotional response makes it ideal for representation within musical and theatrical works. So as Anna has mentioned earlier with the Tristan Chord, uncanniness and sound design can play a crucial role in the development of games and narrative which take audio into account. The uncanny in the viewer or player's response can be manipulated through music, as well as sound effects, graphic design, character design, environment design, story, and dialogue. Based on the needs of a project and the response desired from its players, game developers need to decide whether we are actively aiming for the uncanny in a given project, or whether we're trying to avoid it. In understanding how to effectively create uncanny elements, we look to how it's been evoked unintentionally. I mentioned a few examples earlier, exaggerated facial expression, lip movement, etc. We can also take into account character design, mannerisms, voice acting and intonation, and of course the writing behind their dialogue and characterization. This incorporates the work of not only the writers and narrative designers, but of animators, artists, voice talent, and numerous other roles in game development. As developers and designers, we have the ability to introduce or limit the uncanny as needed. As far as writing and narrative design go specifically, we can define these things at a granular level, planning where, why, and how an element of a game should embrace or avoid the uncanny. In the case of horror games, we have an interest in doing so to enhance the experience of our narratives. To conclude, although the uncanny valley hypothesis falls usually into the realm of the visual, the uncanny itself as something which locates strangeness in the familiar falls well within the purview of narrative design. For every element of a game, there's a person behind the scenes capable of enhancing uncanniness, whether by accident or for the game's thematic benefit. There's a wealth of potential here with plenty of interesting data can to continue studying and creating when it comes to the uncanny and video games. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much for tuning in to our PAX Talk about what horror games can learn from Midsummer. If you'd like to play Skin the Fool with us on Twitter, that is a nice way of saying if you'd uh, like to at us with any questions that you've got, you're welcome to. Um, we also will be posting our slides in case you want to revisit those um, and read our bibliography if you're so inclined. And then uh, we hope that this talk has made you feel held and that you had a good time. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> cool. <laughs>